So this is our innovation panel, and we're going to introduce the, the speakers as we go. And I want to start out and get right into it with Nick Kraft. And Nick is new to our area, but he's not new to healthcare. He's the new senior vice president, the chief sales and marketing offer of Capital District Physicians Health Plan, CDPHP. Uh, and I, to I spoke earlier about some things that are happening in Medicare and Medicaid, we can get this slide, the question up. And the movement of Medicare Advantage plans, which happened a little while ago, into things like long-term care. And where is the innovation, the new value-based payment system that I talked about? How is that playing out? What changes can we expect? And where do we see healthcare going in terms of additional services for people who are seniors and people with disabilities? And for that, I give you Nick Kraft. Keep trying. This is about technology, right? <laughs> there we go. There we are. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's so wonderful to be here. Um, so when Lou gave, gave me the opportunity to speak uh, in front of all of you, I, I jumped at the opportunity. There's just so many exciting things happening right now, right now in, in healthcare. And really the way that you'll view the healthcare system in the next five years is going to be vastly different. And the pandemic has really shown a willingness uh, to change, uh, you know, behaviors, right? So we're seeing a rise in um, the, the need to stay in the home and acceptance of, of telemedicine. And then you add into that demographic changes with baby boomers um, aging in place. Um, you know, we're really starting to see what does that look like when you have uh, a rise in technology, demographics, psychodemographics, and uh, personalized healthcare driving change. Um, and at the same time, the incentives and the alignments uh, are starting to move in the industry from fee for service to a value based uh, care model. Um, you know, and then that fractionalization of healthcare from being industry, or excuse me, like hospital centric to um, you know, keeping people in the home it is at foot. And we're really starting to see what happens when you add tight care management um, and unlock the right incentives and alignment. How does that lead to lower cost, better data integration, and makes it easier uh, to really get care within that delivery system? Um, you add in that where you have increasing quality and satisfaction rates, we're really starting to see a move away from, uh, you know, or move towards that long-term value-based care and move away from, you know, episodic care, right? 30, 90, 60 day care service episodes. And where that is really exciting is around, how do we look at those members holistically? How do we start to really uh, you know, take a chronically ill person that really needs to be with a health plan for the long term and begin to work with them uh, through population management, through that care management that I was talking to, coming in and out of different services um, and begin to take that risk on to have the flexibility to uh, really work um, and deliver the highest quality of care. 80% uh, of the Medicare population uh, is, is uh, you know, where it is chronically ill, and that's where all the spending is. Excuse me. 80% <laughs> of the Medicare spending is on the chronically ill. I apologize. That they're, not, they're, not the, uh, <laughs> they're not the sick ones. Make sure I get that right. Um, and, and so really there's, uh, there's, you know, an opportunity for us to provide better outcomes uh, for, 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 you know, the population to live more fulfilled lives and to spend more time uh, with family and friends, um, and in some cases, age in place. And so the industry is shifting. Uh, the consumer wants it, the family, the caregivers want it, and the outcomes are proving 
to uh, you know to move in this direction. And so you know that's where we're headed in the next five years. That incentive, that alignment for the first time is really moving into an integrated delivery system. And that uh, move from fee for service to value-based care uh, is here. It's exciting. It's happening now. Uh, at CDPHP, we're now an integrated model. So we're looking at how do we you know, lead with our primary care physicians, lead to keep people out of the home, or excuse me, out of the hospital, keep them in the home, but then when they do have an episode, support them and help them transition back into the community and then to, to reduce re-emissions and, and, and re-hospitalizations. And that uh, is really the direction of where we're headed. So, you know, to answer that question directly, is it's, it's yes. This entire industry is headed towards value. It's innovative and it's being led uh, from the government programs and in, in Medicare in particular. And it's a really exciting time for uh, that collaboration, that partnership, uh, and it's happening right here in New York. So thank you. Circle back and have a, a more open dialogue, but it is an exciting time. And when I started to hear the things that Nick was talking about on, when we did a prep call for the panel, it just opens up a whole new world and, and opportunities for people to get care at the point that they need it. Everybody goes on Medicare at age 65, unless you have a disability. So you can start getting ingrained in the programs and their wellness programs at that point. They're not sick care programs, which is what our healthcare system on a fee for service model has been forever. So it's looking at people's wellness, looking at nutrition and medication management and all the things that people need to do to stay healthy. But that was lip service until now. With value-based payments, Nick, we're bringing the providers, dragging, kicking and screaming many of them into that value-based model where they now have to look at the whole person, look at the patient, the family, and do a lot of things that they didn't have to do before. No, absolutely. And that's where that incentive and that alignment changes. And I think as that incentive continues to, to grow, it'll be less kicking and screaming, but it allows the provider, the doctor to actually go back into the home and um, do what they, they went to, into medicine for, right? And that's not to see 40 patients a day, but it's truly to give that, uh, that you know, the, the care that they so, you know, uh, you know, you know, willingly and thankfully went into medicine to do. And our system with fee for service has, uh, to your point, pulled them away from that. And I think that as they are able to get back into real medicine and that holistic care, it's gonna be a revelation. And, it, it, and I think doctors that are starting to do that and are, that are, are at the forefront of uh, taking on this risk and doing the value and managing the whole patient are the ones that uh, are the most fulfilled and are most, the most excited about what this promise is and what this can unlock for, for everyone. And now it's building a bridge over to the long-term care system, which healthcare and long-term care have for a very long time been two very parallel tracks. And they only spill over when people go off the healthcare track into the long-term care track. And then you're looking at Medicaid and other reimbursements, not health-related reimbursements and not the Medicare program. So it's coming more together. And to me, that's a very exciting concept to treat the whole person and get rid of the silos that we have in healthcare and long-term care, because everybody gets into their own world. And you see that even with our presentations, everybody has their own perspective, but the patient needs to be at the center of everyone's perspective. And everyone has to revolve in orbit around that patient. And value-based payments is leading us in that direction. One of the exciting things that has come about pre-COVID, but has really been fueled by COVID, is the rise in the use of telemedicine. And coming into the home with medical care, with social care, with things that can be brought right into the home of the individual. Uh, and, and I could go around the room right now, I bet you all have experiences with people that you know who have had an episode, who have needed hospitalization, who have had to wait in emergency rooms, wait in the parking lot, sitting in an ambulance to get into the ER. The ER is not the best place for seniors to be. And so right now, telemedicine has taken off. We are very lucky to have with us today the founder and chief executive officer of UCM Digital Health, a rapidly growing local company 
with a, a market that just keeps expanding. And Keith Algazin is going to talk to us. And Keith, how has telemedicine reshaped the healthcare landscape? And what do you see lying ahead? All right. Well, first of all, uh, so nice to be in person, isn't it? I mean, uh, so many of you I have seen over the years and I feel like it's like this long lost reunion, like, oh my gosh, where have you been? And you've been right here all along. We've just seen you on the Zoom cameras or on conference calls, but, but it's nice to be here. It's nice to, to see a lot of uh, familiar faces. So glad, glad you all made it here. Um, and uh, listen, we're, we're expanding, right? You said there's like 800 people online. So um, I think it's, uh, the world is hybrid, whether you're working, um, whether you're sick, whether you're um, doing conferences. So um, I, I just wanted to say that. So telehealth, digital health, telemedicine, all, all of those things, um, this is a once in a lifetime change in healthcare that we're actually gonna see right now. And, you know, Lou sort of alluded to this, that this really was happening pre-COVID, but, but when, when telehealth first started, like any new market, what, what tends to happen is you, know, you got this bell curve, right? And at the very beginning of a bell curve, especially in a massive industry like healthcare, in a huge, huge sort of financial um, impact that it can have, you see in the early days, actually, that it, it often isn't built around the patient. Because what happens is the, the financial incentives really set up sort of the innovative companies and the, the early adapters in this mode of let's build point solutions that scale really, really fast and can grow to meet the financial needs that the healthcare system lives in in really a, a B2B market. Um, so what you saw early on was huge amounts of money flowing into to digital health and telehealth, lots of point solutions, you know, but you really couldn't see the forest through the trees. And even those who could see the forest through the trees still were building trees because that's where the financial incentives align when you're, when you're doing things uh, at the beginning of a new market, which digital health was maybe, you know, 10, 15 years ago. COVID only actually accelerated that in, in the markets. So lots of money flowing in and lots of new things happening, new point solutions. But the thing that COVID did was it brought the traditional healthcare system, who um, being big behemoths as they are, are often sort of in the middle of the bell curve, sometimes even late adopters to something new. It brought everybody in, right? I mean, how many in this room have had a telehealth con uh, consultation with one of their medical providers in the past few years? Right. If I asked that question when I was on a panel pre-COVID, there'd be like three people raise their hand. Right. So that's what COVID did to dramatically accelerate it. And that's what excites us at UCM, because um, we are, you know, those of you who don't know us, we're, we're, we're providers at heart. We are we are clinicians at heart and we've built our solutions around the patient. Uh, we're really a bottoms up solution that focuses on the patient and then we're gonna push the healthcare system to get it right. When, when a lot of systems and a lot of things are built around the healthcare system and they kind of try to trickle it down to fit the patient's needs, we've got we've to really focus on the patient. So what the seed change uh, is coming though is we're now not seeing the trees being built. We're looking at the forest through the trees and realizing that digital health is simply part of the glue that really delivers that whole person healthcare, right? Because if it's a point solution, then its limitations are, are dramatic and it, and it runs the risk of even fragmenting care and, and hurting patient care. But when you put telehealth into just the regular framework of a patient, so you talk about post-discharge, right? So why wouldn't it be that if you got discharged from the hospital, you don't have to wait a week or two to get into your doctor for your first checkup. Why wouldn't I discharge you from the hospital three days earlier and have a quick telehealth check-in 12 hours after you're home? Make sure you're okay. And why wouldn't I, if needed, after I check in, send somebody to your home to, to make sure that, that you're set up and getting the care you needed? And why wouldn't we make sure that that's integrated 
with the doctors that cared for you in the hospital and the doctors that cared for you uh, are gonna, gonna care for you outside of the hospital. Well, that's where technology comes into play because it's really the glue in between all of the care episodes that you have that digital health and telehealth are gonna transform healthcare. It, it's not these episodes. It's gonna be in between the episodes because what happens at, at 2 a.m., if done right, could dramatically change the course of your next episode. And, and that's really Lou, what we're really excited about is this post-COVID movement is really focused on whole person, digitally integrated healthcare and getting rid of the silos. Um, and the business models that Nick is talking about um, is the final driver that's gonna actually make this happen. So you work now, Keith, with CDPHP. Yep. Tell, your, your telehealth is, is part of CDPHP's platform for its insureds. And you did a study with them pre-COVID. Just talk a little bit about that study and the results and, and why this is so important to the entire healthcare system as the underpinnings of that value-based payment system. Yeah, I mean, the, the specific CDPHP use case was one where we went into Rensselaer County and they obviously were having a problem like many counties where the, the ERs were overcrowded. In particular, um, you know, even our 911 system was being overused because, you know, listen, if I always, I, I'm, I'm unapologetically on the patient side. So this is not a patient problem, right? You're sick, you're injured, you're scared, you're anxious. You may pick up and call 911 because you don't know any better. It's not the patient's fault. Uh, but when that happens, how can the healthcare system step in and say, wait a second, how about we get the right care at the right place at the right time for you? Just because you call 911 doesn't necessarily mean that you need to be in the hospital today. So we started working with Rensselaer County to intercept 911 calls when they were uh, low acuity and it wasn't an emergency. We started working with the EMS agencies to have the, the ambulance crew show up at the house, do an initial assessment. And if it wasn't um, required medically, um, we, we, we could we, we keep them in their home and we can do a telehealth consult with our ER providers. We can give them medication in the home. We can set them up for their next doctor's appointment and keep them out of the hospital. So those results showed what they always show when, when UCM um, works within the healthcare system, which is, you know, when, when, when appropriate, 95% of the time, you can avoid those, those costly ER visits. When it's appropriate, then that's the only place you belong. But when, it, when, when it's actually um, feasible to keep someone home, you can keep them home 95% of the time if you put the right infrastructure in place. So the, the, the data is clear that when you integrate telehealth with the infrastructure, health plans, physicians, hospitals, community resources, like we're all talking about here, the glue will be telehealth, but the solutions themselves will, will often be the same. And that's, that, that's what we showed in Rensselaer County. And that's what we're, we're showing across the country now. And one of the examples that we've talked about and we experienced in, uh, in our pilot program is that EMS services were totally dissociated from the healthcare system. They, they brought people from their home to the hospital, and that's what they get paid to do. And so all an EMS can do is transport people. If they go to the home and they don't transport, they don't get paid. So if all you have is a hammer, everybody looks like a nail. You have to transport in order to get paid. And EMS is run on a very thin margin. A lot of them are volunteer services. So the work that's now being done with this shared risk, and that's really what it comes down to, the hospital, the EMS, telemedicine, and the home care providers. Talk a little bit about how you're working now with the EMS services and how they're now being integrated into healthcare. Yeah, you said it, Lou. I'm versus that we have. The, um, the, the paramedics are, are highly trained medical folks who are very, very comfortable working in the home. I mean, listen, they, they work in some of the most, you know, harrowing situations out there, right? They're, they, they, are, they are true heroes, but their skill set today is, I mean, it is largely driving people to the hospital. Um, so as an ER provider myself and as our team founded by ER providers, we used to work with paramedics all the time in the field before they got to the hospital. Then we worked with them for the first few minutes when they come into the hospital. So we knew their skill set. So we now work with paramedics to say, how can we use the skills that you have 
the community relationships you have, the, the coverage area you have, um, to actually go into the home and provide some of the very same care that we can provide in the hospital, in the home, because they can assess, they can treat, they can put in medication for us. If we need to step up to, to more care, we can step up to more care. If we need to step down to just, just doing a telehealth visit the next time, we can do that. So the EMS sort of really, really flies in sort of two zones. One is when they show up from a 911 call, let's actually bring them to the hospital when it's appropriate. Maybe we should bring them to the urgent care if that's appropriate. Maybe we should bring them nowhere but treat them in their home when that's appropriate. Instead of a one size fits all, meaning no matter what, we pick them up and drive them to the hospital. But you need telehealth to do that. And you need the physicians on the other side of that phone call to give medical direction to make sure the patient feels comfortable with what's happening with the decision, right? You're seeing the same ER doc as you would have seen in the ER, for example. You're seeing them, you know, over video. And the paramedic being the hands, eyes, and the ears and the trusted relationship that's in the community and could come back tomorrow if you need it. And the other mode we see is deploying the, the, the paramedics when either a community physician like a primary care physician or a telehealth provider like one of our providers recognizes something is going on. And rather than not, not knowing enough information or not being able to solve the problem in the home, let's send these experts to the home and let them do what they do that they would normally do in the hospital in the home. And now again, it's just another avenue that you can get people comfortably treated at home where they can trust it because it's from local resources, which is really important. So the resources coming together, you've got the hospital participating in value-based payments. So they want the person to stay in their home because they're getting paid to have them not go to the emergency room. The EMS now can be paid. And as Dan Bazile said earlier, follow the money. If they're getting paid to do this treatment, guess what? They're gonna do this treatment. And I know the EMS people very, very well. We work very closely with them. They love treating people. That's so much better than just putting them in a car and driving them to the hospital. So for them, it's a, it's a value in and of itself to be able to do a paramedic level treatment in the home. But now you've got the payers. And, and Nick, maybe you wanna talk about where this is going. It all comes down to who bears the risk. And it's the payers, it's the health insurers. Medicare, Medicare Advantage, private health insurance that bears the risk for health care. How is this all coming together? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I love that example uh, that we were giving around EMS in the home, right? And, and really starting to look at uh, in that moment, what's the best care that the patient needs? And it might not be going to the hospital. It might be staying at home and, and working on a wound there and allowing the EMS uh, staff to uh, really, um, you know, uh, do what they were trained to do, right? And that was provide immediate care and then keep them there. So what, we, what we're moving from is a perverse incentive, right? Previously, the incentive would have been uh, to drive them to the hospital because that's how they got paid. But today we're moving into, uh, you know, an opportunity where they're going to get paid to, to do the care in the home, keep the member in the home, keep them safe, um, you know, reduce the risk of, uh, of what could happen. And I, I think what we're starting to see is that the standard of care is expensive, right? The, the, the way that we have done things, uh, that the standard hasn't improved outcomes. And what we're looking at doing now is, is saying, how can we patch all of these different, uh, you know, moments within uh, and, and different uh, silos within the healthcare system, break down those walls and connect them? And you know, realizing that, that that connection is where we're gonna see those outcomes that we were just talking about uh, really change. That alignment is something that is completely different. And I, I think that it's, it's a bunch of different areas that I alluded to earlier coming together, allowing us to, for the first time, build that patchwork and really begin to say, what happens when we look at a member uh, centric care? What happens when we look holistically? What happens when we change the incentive and the alignment? And, uh, you know, and what, what's happening is we're seeing better outcomes. We're seeing re reduction in, in costs. Um, we're seeing improvements in quality. And that together is a really powerful narrative and story that uh, is going to provide a, an opportunity for, um, you know, a, a better outcomes and, and aging in place. And, um, you know, that's the future. 
That's, uh, it's cheaper, it has better outcomes, and it's what the consumer wants. Um, so it's, it's, it's very rare where you have so many wins that can come together to come together uh, the way that we're seeing right now. So this is coming out of Washington, out of CMS through federal dollars in Medicare, Medicare Advantage, and, and other federal programs. We heard this morning about all the things the state has flush with cash, follow the money. Greg Olson talked about all the different programs that NYSOFA is doing. How do those get down to the level where they can mesh with all the things that we just talked about so that the social network can mesh with the healthcare network? And for that, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Becky Preevy. And Becky is the executive director of the Association on Aging in New York, and she represents 59 county offices for aging. Becky? Thanks, Lou. And uh, just to kind of follow up on, on what the panel said and what Lou said, um, in my current role, I'm able to support the 59 offices for the aging throughout the state that Greg oversees. So I'm tired, as you can tell. <laughs> um, and I, I think, you know, there's no better opportunity for a conversation like this than with this group of people. And so um, really what I wanted to talk about is really the theme of today, which is how we can network social safety net programs, community-based organizations, offices for the aging with the healthcare network in the end to not only drive costs down, but as Lou said, to make that patient experience the best that it can be. Um, and I'm really glad that I can, I, I can share with this group that not only do I, I work in the aging community, prior to that, I was a hospital discharge planner. So I understand both lens very, very well. Um, and I know a lot of you here are social workers because you're getting credits. When you talk about culture um, in healthcare settings, doctors yell at nurses, nurses yell at aides, everybody yells at the social worker. So um, <laughs> I feel camaraderie for that. Uh, and what I'm going to talk to you guys about is really not mind blowing, but I think that the metrics and the data that are behind it are really telling. Um, the core of the conversation today has been we can't work in silos. It doesn't work for the systems. It doesn't work for the New York State budget, and it doesn't work for the patient. So what I wanted to talk about were things that we have piloted, that we have looked into data and metrics and outcomes, and we know how much return on investment we're getting by being inclusive of community-based organizations. Um, so I want to start with the aging population in and of itself. I know Greg touched on this briefly this morning. Um, in our home care program, we serve non-Medicaid eligible individuals. So they're, they're just above the income benchmark for Medicaid benefits, but they can't afford to privately pay for the service. This is where prevention comes into play. Um, and part of our advocacy work is to really talk about, you know, those gray area individuals and what the cost to the healthcare system is if we can't turn on services. So back in 2018, we actually did a deep dive into our waiting list. So New York State Office for the Aging has a fixed budget, so we can't provide authorizations based on need. We have to budget those authorizations across the populations that we serve. Um, out of those individuals on the waiting list, we found that 10% of them went directly to a skilled nursing facility on the Medicaid dime. Another 7% were forced to impoverish themselves down to community-based Medicaid or MLTC plan. When you look at the state share savings on Medicaid of those people, as Greg said, we know they qualify for nursing home placement. We know through our home care program, we serve them for about $6,400 per year. We serve them over six years. We know what those costs are, much, much less than any other service infrastructure. Just on the 10% of people that went to nursing homes who are on our waiting list, the state share on Medicaid was $66 million. So it just shows you the cost benefit to, you know, Medicaid has its place and it's a wonderful program. We, we can serve people and prevent them from spending down to Medicaid and, and save dollars on that end. So um, that's just a, a small glimpse of the customers that we serve. We also did a couple pilot projects throughout the state that really showed some amazing cost benefit analysis. And Al, I'm going to go back to, you know, your macular degeneration lens because some of these programs were discontinued. Um, even though they showed cost savings. So the first was community care connections, which we're doing in Western New York under lifespan of Greater Rochester. Um, that was started years back. There was what was called BIP. It was the Balancing Incentive Payment Program, um, very similar to what DISRIP then came to do and what the next waiver is looking to do. Um, and what we did is we integrated community-based aging services through physicians' offices. So this has now been expanded to 86 different physicians' offices, and what they did is they took Office for the Aging Social Work Services to link uh, individuals to community services, nursing service, services, evidence-based programming, um, home safety modifications, which are allowable through our service infrastructure, and 
things that you don't really think about, but they did benefits counseling. So is someone eligible for SNAP or HEAP or other benefits? Can we get them into a different health insurance plan that may cover more services? And guess what? It decreased hospitalizations by 50% in the first 90 days and 65% over 180 days. E ER visits, which again, another one of the things that we're looking at, they were reduced by 62% in the first 90 days, 72% over 180 days because people were connected with the service infrastructure in their homes. The return on investment for this innovation um, was $4.58 for each $1 invested, which was $2.8 million in one year. Um, so we know these things work. Another one of the pilots that we looked at doing um, in the downstate region was with the virtual senior center and self-help active services for aging model. Um, we did this in Queens and guess what? It was the same type of service. We offered benefit and entitlement assistance, wellness programs, health screenings, care transitions plans, referral to partner agencies, technology, socialization and volunteer opportunities. And guess what? 68% reduction in hospitalizations, 53% reduction in ED visits, 76% reduction in ER, and the doctor will agree with this, for COPD, congestive heart failure, and bacterial pneumonia, the heavy hitters in the older population that get people in the hospital. Um, the hospital costs for the individuals that were in this self-help pilot um, on aggregate were almost $1,800. For a Medicaid customer, it was almost $5,700. Again, huge return on investment. Um, in Erie County, we did a Ready, Set, Home project. And basically, this is something that I did when I was in discharge planning at my local hospital. I knew I needed outside resources. I worked with my office for the aging on a daily basis. They actually came and did rounds with me at the hospital at the bedside. Um, Ready, Set, Home, same type of thing. We brought New York Connects staff to the hospital and skilled nursing facilities to assist with care transitions. Um, to help those discharge planners really make sure that they were engaged in community services um, and provided a warm handoff. I know a lot of what uh, Valerie talked about this morning and the changes in assessments, that's very difficult from the patient's perspective in the community to know who the heck is calling you, who is asking you these questions about your bodily fluids. There is a trust issue. Um, you know, people are getting calls in upstate New York from New York City, and this allowed a warm handoff to an MLTC plan, a waiver, or a PACE model, which is exactly what individuals need. Um, $3.41 were saved for every dollar invested into the program. So um, without getting on my soapbox, I would easily say, we know these things work. We know community-based organizations are the experts in what they do. We know hospitals are hemorrhaging money on social admissions and inappropriate emergency department utilization. It's not their fault. And it's, it's time that we really have to work together to make sure that we're ingrained and we're having these conversations. And I think having payers um, and having technology services available is getting us there. But our overall goal at the end of the day is always the patient or the individual or the family in that home that are just struggling because they this is hard enough for all of us to understand. If you're 82 years old and you have uh, hearing issues, how difficult is it to figure these things out? Um, so we know those models work, and I know we're going to hear a lot more about this uh, later, but we're also really proud of the work that Lou and his team have done with Everhome um, Columbia County. And I just wanted to talk really briefly about the Everhome project because it is, it is a social worker's dream, um, but it's also a patient's dream. And essentially what's, what this project does is it utilizes a partnership between a hospital between life care coordinators and coaches who are the experts in all things long-term care, but also brings in UCM digital health. So you have an opportunity to get assessed by an emergency department physician in what I'm hearing is under seven minutes on average, um, as well as using VivaLink's technology. And when we talk about technology, it's definitely changed the landscape of aging, right? Um, you know, a couple years ago, it was really amazing to see people could FaceTime. That was like the newest thing. Well, now we have technology that can actually safely monitor someone in their home without being intrusive, I might say, um, where you can have monitors in the bedroom, in the bathroom, and um, you can also have a 17-inch touchscreen where you can communicate with your family members. If I'm a caregiver that lives in Alaska and my mom lives in Albany, I can get on that tablet and talk in real time with her, her team members. Uh, there's conversations between the physician's office and the, the home itself. And one of the amazing things that technology can do is it utilizes artificial intelligence to predict things, right? Um, 
anybody that works with, with the older population, you can see people with a urinary tract infection go from very high functioning to delirium in a nursing home in a very short period of time. Um, one of the things that I think was the most powerful in the pilot demonstration is it will actually track bathroom habits. So if you're watching your mom from a distance because she still wants to live independently and you see her go from using the bathroom maybe one time per night for 30 days and then you see three days in a row where she's been up five times, guess what? It says, hello, check on mom. Um, so again, predictive technology that can work with the care team to, make, to provide interventions so we can keep people out of costly skilled nursing facility placements and quite frankly, have a New York be an age friendly state where people can age in their homes and communities. Becky, if you're tired, you don't show it. <laughs> so thank you. Well, we may have a little few minutes uh, left to come back to that, but I want to look now. We've talked about Medicaid and all the Medicaid issues. We've talked about Medicare, but those are government budgets, as you said, that are fixed. The government doesn't have an unlimited amount of money. New York State can't print money, the federal government can and does, but that's a whole different issue. But where is the money going to come from for us for people who 30 years from now are going to need this kind of care. What happened to the conversation of private insurance? Where did it go from the landscape? When I had my call with the legislators, I said, are there any insurance initiatives in New York State right now? 27 years ago, we talked about the Partnership for Long-Term Care, which is one of the most innovative programs in, in long-term care. And Bob Vandy is one of the leading experts in long-term care. And I'm going to turn it to Bob to talk about you know, what happened to the partnership and where has the private insurance market gone? Because when you need hands-on care, we've talked about the Medicaid shortage, the staffing shortage. Cash is king, Bob. Cash is king. That's right. I love that expression. I think I, I think I have a hat in my office with, that says that on it. And I say that only because I know you do that. I do. I have the same hat. <laughs> uh, I, I, and before I get into that, I want to say thank you to Lou and the team for putting together another terrific program. I mean, 27 years, I was doing the math. And I think that either as an attendee or a presenter, as a sponsor, I've been to most of those meetings. So congrats on continuing to put thank on you. just an excellent program. There's nothing like this that I've ever seen. And I bet each of you would agree. I think if you look in the dictionary under innovation, I'm not sure insurance is one of the words that's gonna drop out of the sky, right? Right when you see that. So it might not, and I know this is a very dangerous time right after lunch, so hopefully everybody loaded up on Coke and Diet Coke and the caffeine is starting to kick in because I know it's not necessarily the most riveting topic, all deference to my friend, Nick, also my insurance partner on the panel here. But look, it is, there have actually been some innovations. Nick shared some great stuff on his side of the fence, there is that artificial wall that you alluded to, Lou, which is, you know, acute care. And then once you hit that artificial wall and you go into the more maintenance level of care, you get into chronic extended care and so forth. From an insurance standpoint, long-term care insurance is what has typically been the predominant private solution to help with that, other than paying out of pocket, of course. Um, we've seen innovations, you know, you heard from Frank talking about the innovations in the mortgage market, the reverse mortgage market and so forth. So those have developed. On the insurance side of the fence, I, I would say it's been more of an evolution and there have been some pretty interesting recent developments. I think one of the things that we've seen, we've seen really two things, changes in product at the product level, but then also changes in mindset, not only at the patient level or as I'll refer to it, policyholder or client level, uh, but then also at the advisor level, if you will, because we, we're a wholesaler. We're at advisors, insurance brokers. We work directly with the insurance agent or advisor to go find the right product to fit the client scenario. And we heard, I think John McDonald earlier was talking about the importance of being proactive and the fact that we can't wait and have the conversation from an insurance standpoint until it's too late. A lot of you, I suspect, are having that conversation right then. You're in crisis mode. You're reactive. We don't have that luxury. People do need to qualify medically for the products that we provide. So that underscores the importance of planning in advance with those products. It's interesting, about 15 or 16 years ago, Consumer Reports came out with an article about long-term care insurance and, and their, their recommendation was, wait till you turn 65 and then go look at long-term care insurance. And the insurance providers ran for the exits in all of their collective buildings because it not only was it not true then, it's less true now. It's more important to start earlier. So that's one of those mindset changes that we've seen. Historically, from the product standpoint, Lou alluded to the New York State Partnership Program, which is a terrific program, and it was indeed innovative when it, when it started. The problem is it's very quiet right now. There really are no carriers that are participating in that. There is a shell 
of a New York State partnership uh, in New York State right now, but for a number of reasons that we unfortunately don't have time to get into, uh, there's really not a lot of activity in that space. Carriers have pulled out of that space uh, for a number of reasons, so that's been a challenge in that regard. That has left the industry, at least vis-a-vis -vis New York, to say what else can we do? And when you combine some of these other challenges that we've heard so much about, the home care challenges, uh, you know, it's really led, if there is to be a viable insurance industry, they have to be innovative. Historically, what we've seen in terms of the way that the products have paid benefits, it's been a traditional long-term care insurance product, a standalone or traditional product, if you will, and it's paid on what's known as a reimbursement basis. So depending on whether you're receiving care at home, receiving care within the context of an assisted living setting, or whether you're receiving it in a facility, in a nursing home, you incur the expense, at least in theory, you incur the expense and then you get reimbursed for it after that. And you can redirect the reimbursements to be paid directly to the provider if you want to. One of the challenges that has resulted from that is, as Lou alluded to, and you're all more aware of than I perhaps, and that is that that's not always feasible. We've heard a lot today about the staffing challenges, right? So if you're in that situation where, especially in a rural environment, where maybe it is just not cost effective and you can't get a care provider, a home health aide, for example, to travel 60 miles in his or her car to go out to deliver that service to someone because it's just not cost effective, that unfortunately, that, that reimbursement model that we've become so familiar with on the insurance side, it works when it works. So if you're in a more urban or even suburban environment where there is maybe a little more likelihood that you can get that service and it can be reimbursed, okay, the, the policy certainly is gonna do its work and we move on. In that more rural example, that's becoming more problematic. Can we agree on that? So what we've seen is that we've moved away, I don't wanna say we've moved away. There is still certainly a traditional long-term care insurance market that is viable. Uh, we, we actually have one main carrier in our brokerage space that we use here in the state of New York. And what they've done is they've combined, they've taken a basic reimbursement model for their payment of services, and they've added a rider that pays what's known as a cash benefit. So you have the alternative of choosing, and you can toggle between the two each month. The cash benefit pays a lower benefit than the reimbursement, but it does still provide one very important component, and that is that flexibility. You know, we heard Peter was talking earlier about, you know, that gray area or that gray world. So the good news is that when you have cash payable, as I just described, the good news is it gives you inherent flexibility. The bad news is, you know, how careful do we need to be with regard to how we're paying that? Are we doing the right bookkeeping? Are we being friendly with DOL and tax and finance and so forth? So we've got some of those issues that we need to contend with. Those two methodologies have been valid within that traditional product. What we've seen more recently has been the, the evolution and the, really the growth of life insurance products that have special riders on them that allow for the payment of long-term care benefits within those products. And not exclusively, but a vast majority of them, they pay their benefits either in the form of long-term care or sometimes referred to as chronic illness in a cash or what they sometimes refer to as indemnity basis. And that provides that flexibility. So if I had to pick one innovation as it relates to the insurance end of it and, and the long-term care insurance end of it in particular, it's probably the, the continued growth of those cash or indemnity-based benefits where I have this life insurance policy that has a rider, I can get at those benefits in, in the form of a living benefit, and I can use those proceeds in a manner of speaking for whatever I want. I don't have to worry about going through the reimbursement process. I can take that cash uh, benefit that is typically paid on a monthly basis, and then I can pay for whatever I want. I can pay for my actual care, or I can pay for some of the technologies that we've heard a little bit about on the panel here today. And who knows where we're gonna be five, 10, 20 years from now. So those types of policies have become incredibly popular because of that inherent flexibility that they have. They've also countered two concerns that people have had with traditional long-term care insurance, which don't get me wrong, still a viable product. The premiums are more stable than they have ever been, but they've gone up a lot in recent years. So the, the premium guarantee nature of traditional long-term care has been an uh, object of concern for consumers, which is understandable. And the other concern that sometimes comes up is, well, what if I never need long-term care? 
what do I get for what I paid in in premium? And although it's a pure insurance product, that traditional long-term care product, and we can talk about it like it's homeowner's insurance or auto insurance, where if you don't use it, you unfortunately lose it. People have a different mindset sometimes when it comes to traditional long-term care. So these newer products not only countered both of those concerns in often guaranteeing the premium and providing a death benefit so that if there is no long-term care, chronic extended care need, there's a death benefit that's paid to the estate, but it also provides by virtue of that cash or indemnity benefit, it provides the flexibility to be able to pay for care, however it might be present in that situation. So I think that the last thing that I would add to that, that's probably the biggest item, Lou, the last thing that I would add in terms of what we see happening at the state level and what maybe the state can do to help, our biggest challenge in the, in the state of New York is frankly regulation. Uh, we have a very, a very, to its credit, Consumer Protective Insurance Department or Department of Financial Services. The flip side of that is that there's very much a 49 in one mentality with the state of New York DFS as well, which means that you know, we do business all throughout the country. So I, if I'm talking to an agent or an advisor in Ohio or Texas or California, there's this different world of the different products that are available. A prime example is a deferred annuity product that has a long-term care rider. Well, 49 states or a few, a few less than that, but most of the other states allow for those products. The state of New York won't approve those products. So we've tried to compel the state to maybe take a fresh look and think about their, some of their pricing methodologies and what they'll approve for product. And we'd love to see them ease that regulation and, and uh, maybe see about making these products available that almost all, if not all other states have available. So we'd like to see that. And then we'd love to see them revisit the New York State Partnership yeah. as Lou alluded to, because at the end of the day, it was a terrific program. Um, I took part in a New York State Partnership redesign team a few years back. We made some recommendations and unfortunately it just haven't gotten off the floor. So I think that'd be really beneficial to see that. Great. Thanks, Lou. Thank you, Bob. So as an elder law planner, we want to have, as I said, every arrow in the quiver. And when a client comes in and they have insurance, we don't have to use that verb and medicate it. We don't have to go through the Medicaid portal to get care. They have an ability to make choices, maintain more independence, not have the rigors of a Medicaid application. Home equity, private insurance, all those things play in. Uh, Becky mentioned a pilot program that we've been very fortunate to be part of. And it came through a grant from the Home for the Aged. Well, the Home for the Aged had no more home. They, they had run a, a very nice adult home in Hudson, New York, and they sold it. So they had money, but no purpose for the money. So we, we met with them and talked to them about creating a program that created virtual homes for the aged and bringing the ability to get care in the home. All the things that Keith was talking about, the home care, the home care technology, all the services that Becky was talking about, bringing them into the home care ecosystem and linking it with technology. And who's, who's left out of the conversation so far today? Who hasn't really been focused on? The caregiver. What about the children? And I'm a nephew that's a caregiver for a 99 year old aunt right now. Um, and I've been a caregiver four times for two parents, an aunt and an uncle. What about the caregivers? How do they participate in this? How do they become an integral part of it? Well, that app that you see on the screen is in the palm of that caregiver's hand. And they have every piece of data coming out of the home. They can communicate. They can learn exactly what just happened at the telemedicine visit. They can pop right into to the living room and on a screen and have a conversation with their parent and do it in a way that's in real time with all of the information that they need to inform that care. And we're building out the ecosystem with the home for the aged. Uh, Becky happens to chair the committee uh, the, the group, the not-for-profit called Everhome Columbia Inc. that is running this pilot program. And, and Becky, just talk for, for 60 seconds about that. And I want you to make, get the last word on the 1115 waiver and why those funds need to go into these kinds of programs. Oh, boy. Is this one on? Okay. Um, so I'm going to tackle the first question first, obviously. So as Lou said, I am blessed to actually chair this committee um, with a group of colleagues that are just really forward thinkers and at the end of the day, really care about people in the community and their caregivers, as Lou said. 
Um, there was a MetLife mature market study that was, was done back in 2006, I believe it was, that looked at the cost to employers having working caregivers that didn't feel supported. And it was to the tune of about $3 trillion per year nationally. And any of you that work in a workspace know how many people are at work trying to coordinate care for mom or dad, making phone calls, leaving for appointments, or are just really stressed out because they were up all night the night before um, and are trying to be at work that day. So um, for, for me, this, this actually checks all the boxes. It, it's literally everything. If I envisioned how to care for people at home successfully, this would be the way to do it. Um, and I think it alleviates a lot of the issues many of you may see. Um, my biggest frustration trying to get people home from the hospital was when someone told me they're not safe at home. Well, I can't get 24-hour day care because there's no home health aides. A skilled nursing facility on paper offers 24-hour day supervision, but how many hours is a resident really left alone? This fixes those issues. Um, and it's, it's really a low cost, high yield intervention that forces all of these providers in, corrals us all in one direction to say, how can we holistically look at patient care, work with a team of physicians, emergency room physicians, caregivers, the individuals themselves, and technology for holistic patient care. And this is exactly what it is. Thank you. 1115 waiver. What should these folks be doing? That's a, a loaded question, Lou. It is. Um, public, that's why I asked you, nobody else. <laughs> but there are public hearings coming up. There is advocacy that's needed. The, the New York State government is, is looking to carve up $13.5 billion. How do we make sure it goes to the right place? I would say twofold. Number one is advocacy, advocacy, advocacy. Everybody here has someone um, in their district that has been elect elected to the Senate or the Assembly, obviously the governor's office. People need to be vocal. Uh, these public comment periods are really integral. It, this becomes part of the public record if you submit a letter or you make a public comment. And to give a little bit of background, when you look at what DISRIP was over the course of the previous five-year iteration, um, take a wild guess how many dollars percentage-wise of the $8 billion was funds flowed to community-based organizations? Two. You're very close. Did I tell you that? No. Um, you did. Okay, perfect. Um, it was 3%. 3% of all the total dollars went to hospital systems. And, you know, they absolutely needed it. What I can tell you, community-based organizations do all social determinants of health. So the big words that we're talking about with this proposed waiver are, you know, holistic care, social determinants of health, et cetera, et cetera. What do we do? Housing, transportation, home delivered meals, registered dietitians and counselors, home care services. Um, I, just to name a couple, we're embedded in health systems to assist people with care transitions. There can't just be funds flow to large provider systems that have back office support and infrastructure to take funding. There has to be a community-based organization infrastructure for people to get dollars. Um, I can tell you advocacy works because um, you guys know me now, I'm very vocal. Um, I was on one of the upstate PPS uh, board of directors during the DISRIP initiative as a community-based partner. And in that region, 6% of all the DISRIP dollars went to CBOs. So it does make a difference. It's really important. And, you know, you guys are the boots on the ground doing the heavy lift and the, the big work, and you need to be reimbursed for it. And the last thing we want to see is an opportunity for for-profit companies that are going to come into New York and dictate where people go to make money off the fact that we are fourth in the nation as far as the older population fastest growing segment of that population is the 80 plus. Uh, people are not naive to the fact that there's, you know, you talked about the economic value this morning with Greg. Um, it's really, really important that we maintain um, completely independent and objective service providers in the community, but they need to be funded and they need to be funded equitably with the healthcare system. Amen. I'd like to bring our next panel up. A nice round of applause for the innovation panel. And I'd like to introduce my partner, Aaron Connor and his panel, which he will introduce. So now, what do these new Medicaid regulations mean? Let's get back into the weeds and talk about the details of how Medicaid is gonna work under the system that Valerie Bogart was describing to you earlier. <laughs> 